this happened to me two to three years ago. I was around 23 at the time. I am a female and I live in Romania. One night I was coming home from class. Master, classes after 6 p.m. and end at 10 p.m. at around 11 p.m. I had to take the subway for about 12 stops. The destination I had to get off at was at the end of the line for the subway. At the time, there wouldn't be many people in the subway. I'm a pretty lonely person. All I need is my headset and my music and I'm good to go. Said and done, I plug in my music, pick the furthest chair in the subway, away from the only two people that were taking the subway with me at that time. So far, so good. Until I see, with the corner of my eye, a silhouette approach me and sit right next to me. It was a man, fairly built, dark hair, wearing glasses, a black hoodie and a sickening smile. He doesn't engage in talking with me but would just stare at my phone as I would browse through my music. I can hear him breathing heavily, not like painfully but still like he was feeling something very strong. I feel uneasy so I decide to change my seat and go even further behind, trying to avoid him without looking like a freak myself. I don't know to whom, there was just another person with us the whole way, I guess that scared me even more. I pick a new chair, sit down, plug my headset again and proceed with the remaining stops on my way home. I see the silhouette growing bigger and bigger and a breeze running on my skin as I realize the guy is again sitting right next to me, glancing in mid-air, dead eyes, a big smile, staring right into my phone. I panic, there are still four stops to go, I have nowhere to hide. I look after the other person in the subway trying to sit next to her, thinking that strength comes in numbers. She is no longer there. I start shaking a bit, but not allowing the creeper to notice me being vulnerable. I stand up, go to the door, and just decide to stand until my stop comes. This way he won't sit next to me, right? Wrong. He comes straight after me, sits on my chair right near the door, and because he couldn't see my phone, on which he was so focused so far from that angle, he fixates on me right in my soul with his black dead eyes and says, Hi gorgeous, why are you avoiding me? I'm freaking out as I look at my phone trying to call my boyfriend or message him and he stops me by saying, I know no one will help you, you would have sent an SOS message by now and I know you didn't. That moment that I realize I'm cornered, he's been focusing on my phone to see who I was talking to, trying to figure out if I panic, trying to see if I would ask someone for help. He cornered me bad. I had the luck to reach my stop as I would delay any reaction or ignore him so that he would repeat whatever he wanted to say. I drop off and run for the exit, not looking back. I get out at the surface and I don't see him anymore. At this moment, I put my phone in my purse and realize I had pepper spray with me all along. My heartbeat comes back to normal as I know I at least have something to defend myself with, but still a long way to get home, and who knows if he is alone or not. I walk rather fast for maybe five minutes from the metro and feel a hand grab my wrist hard, pulling me back, another hand covering my mouth, disabling me from screaming my lungs out. It was him. The same black hoodie, dark eyes, and dead eyes stalker. He was furious and said, Running from me? How dare you run away from me? You should be honored I give you attention. No, I'm fairly built for a woman. 80 kilograms and 1.75 meters tall, so I guess he thought men don't find me beautiful or something and should feel blessed a creep like him stalks me and tries to hurt me. Now my phone is in my bag. I can't call the police. I can't reach for the pepper spray. I panic. I can't punch him in the crotch. I can't scratch him as I don't have long nails. His hand is still on my mouth. What do I do? I did the most desperate and disgusting thing I could think of just to save my life. I played along. I use my other hand to touch the inside of his thigh and mumble, I'm sorry while his hand was on my mouth. He took his hand off my mouth and I repeated that I'm sorry, 
I didn't realize he was just flirting. He left his guard down and took his hand off my wrist. He asked me for my phone number and address to drop me off, but I refused, saying I'd rather add him on Facebook, and he agreed. I told him I'd reach for my phone, but instead picked up the pepper spray and got him sprayed all over his face, made sure that I'd cover both eyes, nose, mouth, even his ears and hands. He was instantly all red, suffocating from the pepper and swelling. I called the police, told them what happened and what I did. They asked me if he is immobilized and I said yes as the effect wears off in 45 minutes. The police arrived there five minutes later to see me shaking like a leaf and a man on the ground, swollen like a pumpkin, throwing up and swearing at me between gasps of breath. He was arrested and the police told me they had been looking for him for the past week as they discovered the body of a 24-year-old woman in his apartment, a fairly built lady, 1.77 meters tall, 75 kilograms, red hair, I have red hair too. The woman was his girlfriend and ever since, he's never gotten back to the apartment. I don't know what he wanted to do with me. I can understand why he targeted me due to the similarities but stranger in the subway stalking women at midnight trying to befriend them or even worse. I hope to God you never, ever get out of jail. I used to work the stand-up circuit in Boston and let me tell you, that was a wild time to be a comedian. And when you were like me and chose to get the tea everywhere, it was even wilder. For those of you that don't know, the tea is just what we call the subway in Beantown. And although it might not have the same nationally terrible reputation as New York's subway, I can assure you it used to be just as tough. Now, this happened way back when phones were just starting to get video recording technology and being something of a gadget freak, I paid out the butt to be one of the first to own one. So, one night, I'm coming back from a show just playing with my new phone when some girl gets out of the train and sits down opposite me. We make this tiny bit of eye contact, nothing confrontational, and as the train gets moving again, I carry on wasting time with my new toy. I'm going through some photos I'd taken at a show I'd done recently, and I remember I was smiling, in a real good mood when I suddenly hear, Are you recording me? I look up and it's the girl, some ratchet South Boston girl who looked like she hadn't slept in a year. She's got this look on her face that looked like a Rottweiler chewing a wasp and when I'm like, who you? She screeches, yeah me, you better not be recording me with that thing. I couldn't resist, I was like, why would I make a video of you? I leave prettier things in the toilet every morning. Not the smartest move to just antagonize her like that, but hey, it's what I do for a living, and I was very much still in work mode. The retort seemed to do the trick for a minute, and the girl shut her mouth for a while and left me in peace. Then a minute later, she starts up again. Oh, you think you're wicked smart, huh? You think you're hot stuff? I was only two stops away from home, so I decided to toy with her a little. Nothing too harsh, just enough to pass the time until I could get off. Then, right as I'm getting off, I actually wish her a good night. I'd actually enjoyed our little back and forth, whereas she still looked incredibly mad. I didn't think she'd do what she did, though. I know she was mean, but I didn't think she was crazy. So I'm standing, waiting for the doors to open, and when they do, I instantly feel this real sharp pain right around my butt. I instantly kind of throw myself off the train while spinning around to see what in God's name just happened. There's Ratchet, this big smile on her face, and she's holding a needle in her hand. Jesus Christ. That girl had real summer teeth, you know. Some are here, some are there. All the hallmarks of a hardcore junkie. And as the door started to close behind us, she just started laughing. Turns out she got me a good few times in the butt cheek with that needle and although it only hurt a little for the next few days, my big fear was that I'd gotten some kind of junkie disease like hep C or HIV or something. 
It's kind of a war story I tell these days, but just typing it up like this reminds me of how scared I was. I went straight to the hospital and got checked out, but after taking some blood samples, they told me I'd have to wait a few days to find out the results. Longest days of my life. I took those days off because there was no way I could still be funny with all of that on my mind, but thankfully it all came back clean. It had hurt to sit down for a few days, but other than that, I'd be fine. I actually turned the whole thing into a stand-up bit a few years later, and I suppose that's just my way of dealing with things. But even though I can tell the story these days with a smile on my face, and in a way that can make people at least giggle a little bit, that doesn't change the fact that it was one of the scariest things that ever happened to me. At the time I thought my smart mouth almost cost me my life, in one of the most nightmarish ways to die imaginable. This happened not long ago. I'm 15 going on 16. I live in New York City and have had some strange late night experiences before, but none as disturbing as this one. My parents were out of town. It was a summer night. I was at a pretty large party. There was quite a lot of drinking and smoking, which is expected at a party with a bunch of 14 to like 20 year olds. I'm pretty tall for my age, like 6'1", and I have a pretty deep voice, so I easily pass as older. I knew that I had to get home on my own, so I tried to regulate the amounts of drink that I had. At around maybe 2 or 3 a.m., I realized that I should start heading home. It was a Friday, and I didn't have anything to do the next morning, but still, I was tired and figured most people would be leaving soon anyway. For those of you that don't know, New York City's transit system runs 24-7, 7 days a week, so I wouldn't have any problems hopping on a train, even at 3 a.m., to get home. I live in an apartment building on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, so I had a pretty long ride to get home. I wasn't worried though, I was no stranger to long commutes on the subway. I would take the train everywhere I went since I was like 9 or 10. I headed over to the train station and sat on one of the benches. There's a screen that says what time the train will be coming, and this late at night it would be a while. After maybe 10 or 15 minutes of waiting, the screen showed a train Inwood 207th Street, 20 minutes. I waited for a while longer until I saw the headlights of the train coming down the tracks. The train arrived, but since this was the first stop, I had to wait about another 10 minutes until it would actually leave the station. I got on and a few people exited, leaving the car empty. I sat all the way at the end of the car, so I wouldn't be next to anyone if anyone else got on. At this point, I was really, really tired and felt like I was about to just pass out right there, so I did. For those of you that don't know, New York City's subway cars are rectangular with three doors on each long side which open at the stations and one door on each short side where people can walk through from other cars. I woke up a little while later to the sound of one of the short side doors close to me opening. A man who appeared to be homeless walked in and the smell immediately hit me like a truck. I remember him having raggy clothes. He looked at me. Hey brother, you got a dollar? Uh, nah man, sorry. I responded. Come on man, I, I know you got something. He insisted, smiling for some reason. Not for real, I, I don't, sorry. I didn't have any singles, just a few twenties, and I wasn't about to give this guy twenty dollars. He just stood there for a few seconds and said, Alright, whatever and walked away, still smiling. Now this didn't strike me as weird at all, not yet at least. I've been living in New York my whole life and I'd gotten used to all the homeless people in the subway and them asking for money. It didn't bother me. I looked out at the stop I was at. I was just in Brooklyn. The A train ran local at night so my ride would be longer than usual. I figured I still had a pretty long way to before I got to the 42nd Street Manhattan where where I would transfer to the Q train that brought me to the station near my apartment. So, I went back to sleep. When I woke up again, I was in downtown Manhattan, I think like West 4th or 14th Street. I was getting close to my stop. I looked around and the train wasn't empty anymore. There was a guy sitting on the other end of the train with his headphones on, and in the middle of the car, there was a guy sitting there, head down, muttering to himself. 
I was pretty sure it was the same guy that had asked me for money before. I thought that was a little weird, but I wasn't nervous or anything. I just figured he had some sort of mental illness or something. After a little while, I arrived at the 42nd Street Station. The guy was still there, and when I got off the train, he must have been going in a similar direction as me because he got up and off the train also. Now, 42nd Street Station is huge, and I needed to go all the way to the other side of the station to get from the A train side on 8th Avenue to get to where the Q train was on 7th Avenue. Walking through the huge station, specifically the passage that takes you from one side to the other, I'll admit was a little creepy. It was eerily quiet for a place that usually is packed with so many people during the daytime. The only other people around now were late night workers and homeless people. I arrived on the side where the Q train would be going uptown towards my stop. When I got to the platform there were only maybe three or four other people that I saw waiting for the train like I was. I walked over to the benches and sat down to wait. I looked up and saw that there was a guy, a little further down the platform on the side from where I came from, standing there, muttering to himself like having a full-on conversation with nobody. I couldn't make out his face from where I was sitting, but I was sure it had to be the same homeless guy that I'd seen on the A-train. Now I was getting a little suspicious. Was he following me? The train arrived after a few minutes and I got on. I'd only have a few stops from where I was to my apartment, so there was no point in trying to sleep. The man boarded the same car as me, and I could see clearly now it was him, the same guy. There wasn't anybody else in the car at the moment. I wasn't entirely nervous, but at the same time I was definitely on edge now. I tried not to look at him to avoid eye contact. He was still mumbling to himself, and now I could pick up on some things he was saying. Random phrases like, Should I... Maybe. Help me. When I got to my stop, I promptly got up and got off the train. Honestly, at this point, I wasn't even surprised when the man got off too, still talking to himself. The station was completely empty. It was 4, going on 5 a.m. by now. I walked through the station, up the stairs, toward the exit, ignoring the man who was definitely following me. When I got to the street level, I started walking faster towards my apartment. The station was on 72nd Street. I still had to walk a few blocks further up to get to my apartment. I looked back a few times to see the man, still behind me, speaking pretty loudly now. I was honestly more annoyed than scared at this point. Maybe it was the tiredness, maybe it was the little bit of liquid courage left in me, but I was seriously done with this guy's stuff, so I stopped walking, turned around and said, Hey, can I help you? I just want some money. I know you got some. Listen, I don't. Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops. He said something about how I don't know all the stuff that he's been through and then just walked in the other direction, still muttering angry slurs under his breath to himself. I continued home, shaken but too tired to think about what happened at this point. I got to my apartment and went to bed. The next morning, my friend who lives in the same building as me called me and asked if I'd heard about what happened last night. I hadn't told anyone about the incident yet, so I said I didn't know what he was talking about and he explained. Apparently a neighbor in our apartment building who was coming back from an early morning jog or something called the police because there was a man lying outside the doors to our apartment. As he was arrested, he was yelling and screaming, resisting arrest yelling stuff about how his life was horrible and how he was waiting to kill that person last night that didn't have the heart to hand over any money to him. I assumed the guy that he was referring to was the guy that I had encountered last night and the guy that he was talking about was me. And he must have followed me all the way to my apartment which, given how tired I was, must have not been that hard to do without me noticing. Who knows what would have happened if the police didn't take him away. The man was obviously seriously ill and I do hope that he gets the help he needs. All I can say to you all is be safe when you're alone at night. Especially in the city, always watch your back.
Only a handful of people from my personal life know this story, but I figured since Reddit can be pretty anonymous, I'd just make a throwaway and get it off my chest one more time. You can call nonsense on it all if you like, I really don't care what anyone has to say about it at this stage, because the truth is, I still might actually go to prison for this. You see, more than 20 years ago I used to work the overnight shift at a 24-hour gas station in a major US city, one that will remain nameless and that I do not live in anymore. As you can imagine, I've got my fair share of crazy stories from my time working there, but only one that still keeps me up at night, and that's the story of Big Sal. One of the things that kind of surprised me about working nights at the gas station was the number of regulars I'd get to know. You figure an overnight gas station would mostly get a mixed assortment of transient strangers, but for some people, mostly other night shift workers, stopping at the gas station became a regular part of their routine, especially since it was the only thing in the area that was open 24 hours. There were a couple of nurses and a few cab drivers that I used to see on the regular, but without a doubt, my favorite was Big Sal. And most nights he'd waddle into the station, pay for his gas, and we'd shoot the breeze for a while. It was kind of annoying at first, being forced to conversate when I felt too tired to even string a sentence together. But after a while, it was kind of nice to see a familiar face to break the boredom and kill some time. But then the thing that really made me like Big Sal was when he brought me a little takeout tray of some food that his wife had made. Occasionally, he'd stay so long that we'd have to pause so I could serve a customer. Sometimes he'd just stand there and mind his business. Other times he'd make a face at me like, get a load of this guy, and I'd have to bite my tongue to keep from laughing out loud. But then this one time, a guy walks in to pay for his gas, so Sal takes a step back from the register and politely apologizes to him. Guy says, no problem. I ring him up, then just as he's going through his wallet, Sal says, hey, don't I know you? The guy looks up, narrows his eyes a little, then innocently says, Hmm, I, I don't think so. Then says something about being up on business for Missouri. Sal just kind of nods for a second, then says, What's your name? The guy stops again, gives his nervous little chuckle, then gives some plain-sounding name that I can't for the life of me remember. But I do remember what Sal said next, because... That got repeated over and over for the next minute or so. Sal says, Nah, that's not you. You're... And then he says a very, very Italian sounding name and accuses the guy of having worked with a friend of his in another large city nearby. Again, the guy denies it, acting like Sal is out of his freaking mind. Even I thought he was telling the truth, but good God, Sal just went off like a deaf Jack Russell and there was just no getting him back in the car. Then right when I think things are about to get heated, with the guy being like, get out of my face, I told you who I am, now leave me alone, please, sir, Sal backs down. He says something like, you know what, I'm sorry, you're right, you just look like an old friend of mine, and I got offended thinking you were trying to duck me. I apologize. Hey, no problem, the guy replied. Obviously still bristling a little. Just, Jesus, listen to what people are telling you for Christ's sake. I don't want to fight anybody, you know? I know, I know, I, I apologize sincerely. I'm ashamed of myself, I really am. Sal says back. I used to get stuff like that a surprising amount. Not always from Sal, just weird little interactions with members of the public where it could either be hilarious or incredibly annoying. So I really didn't think too much of it, I just waited patiently, took the guy's money, and then wished him a nice night. Sal chimes in too, offering another apology, then we watch the guy walk out of the station. The second the door closes, the guy starts walking towards his car. Sal practically jumps into action. Not exactly Sonic the Hedgehog given his size, but he definitely waddled harder and faster than I'd ever seen before. Right as the guy is getting back into his car, I see Sal reaching into his waistband for something. Then bang, 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 bang. I see muzzle flashes. Then the guy's windshield is shattered. And then there's silence again. 
I just stand there for a second, frozen to the spot, unable to properly compute what I've just witnessed. Big Sal. Nice guy Sal. Sal who brings me leftovers and shoots the breeze with me when we're not roasting customers. He just killed a man, and he did it right in front of me. Sal didn't even look back. He just slid the gun back into his waistband and started walking over to the guy's car. When he got there, he opened up the driver's side door, shoved over the guy's body, then got in and drove the car out of the lot. The whole thing was said and done in a matter of seconds. I'm thinking, I need to call the cops as soon as I come to, as soon as I come out of shock. And this is back before I had a cell phone so I used the gas station's phone. A little thought pops into my head. Big Sal, Italian name, works at night, carries a gun, just shot a guy as coolly as I'd take out the trash. He's in the mafia. I'm standing there, phone in hand, wanting to call 911, but I couldn't bring myself to. All I could think of was, what if I call, and he's gonna know. I couldn't have been a mafia witness. Going into witness protection and all that nonsense in my early 20s, are you kidding me? Look, I know I should have called the cops, but I was terrified. I hesitated. What else do you want me to say? The mob was a serious thing where I grew up, not like it is now, and besides, Big Sal had left his car at the pumps, like surely he'd be coming back for it and soon, considering what he'd just done. And think about it. He shows back up, sees the cop car outside. He's going to disappear and have me killed to keep me quiet. He knew so much about me too. Like we'd been talking all summer basically. He'd have been able to have dudes find me in like days if he wanted to. So, I'm standing there at the register, trying not to have a full-blown panic attack when Sal finally shows back up in a taxi. He has a change of clothes. His hair is still damp and... When he walked into the station, I almost choked on the amount of cologne he was wearing. Then he just walks up to the register, addresses me by name, and says, This is a robbery. I just look at him, like what? And he says it again. I said, This is a robbery. Then he pulls out a gun, points it at me. Immediately I'm like, Sal, you don't gotta kill me man, I swear I won't say anything. Hey, 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 calm down. I'm not going to clip you. He replies, just listen to me, okay? Open the register and give me the money. I did as I was told, but I can't even really describe how confused I was. First he shoots somebody, and then he comes back to rob me. Why? Now, because I just robbed you, I'm going to need the tapes too. You catch my drift? He says, and suddenly I get it. He's trying to cover his tracks. I was visibly relieved, trembling as I let him into the back. See, kid, now you're getting it. And this is your money, too. I'm going to come back and give you your cut when this all blows over. I didn't say anything in response. I mean, what do you say to something like that? As I said, I'm calm down a little bit, but I'm still screwed up for having just witnessed a shooting. Sal can obviously detect this, and I don't know how much of what he told me next is true, but this is what he said. He tells me everything's going to be fine and I shouldn't worry about covering for the guy he shot. According to Sal, this dude was a rat, turned state's evidence against his old capo back in the early 80s. Obviously that meant the mob wanted him dead, but there was a twist too. They wanted him dead way before he went all Benedict Arnold on them, because one of his associates ended up catching him at home with a 13-year-old girl. This made its way up to the boss of the family and, boom, the guy gets greenlit. He finds out, so, to save his life, he turns into the star witness in a Rico case. After that, poof, he disappears. What was he doing back home, I don't know. Presumably he dyed his hair, maybe lost a little of his accent after living away for so long, but that didn't fool Sal, and it cost the guy his life. 
I didn't stick around to take my cut. I called up my boss to quit the very next day. I also kept my mouth shut when the cops came around to talk about the robbery. Well, I talked, but I gave Sal's version of the events. Guy in a mask came in, took the money, took the tapes, left. That seemed good enough for them, so after a while, the whole thing just went away. And I'm hoping it stays away too, because... As much as I feel a weird, longing sense of guilt over the whole thing, I just want what's dead to stay buried. I used to work 10pm till 6am at an Arco station as a cashier back in the day. It was on some old country road off of a main highway so we didn't get too many customers. But locals knew it was cheap and open late, so the business just about broke even every month. Since we were in Oregon, where people don't pump their own gas for whatever reason, I used to work with a fuel attendant most shifts. But on one shift in particular, he calls in sick and the bosses couldn't get me a replacement. So, I'm screwed. Doomed to work two jobs for one paycheck for eight solid hours. Then around like 1.30am, I start hearing these creepy scratching sounds coming from the storage room out back. We used to get raccoons out there all the time, scratching away at a piece of exposed drywall in the hopes of getting through to all the snacks inside. The past few times that it happened, I just stuck my head to shout up, Hey, trash panda, enough! And the sounds would normally stop. As usual, they did, so I just went back to browsing Reddit and trying not to fall asleep. But then... The sounds start back up again, which had never, ever happened before, so I'm like, huh, brave raccoons tonight, huh? So I do it again. I call out, and the sounds stop. But again, they start up again within minutes of me sitting down, but this time, when I get up to call out, I hear some loud bashing sound coming from the storage room, and I realize that it's no raccoon making those noises. In retrospect, I probably should have just slammed the door, locked it, and called the cops, but I'm dumb. So I looked. And what do I see lunging at me from a dark corner? But the scrabbiest, most demonic-looking meth head I'd ever seen in my life. I just turn tail and run out of the store as he unleashes this hell scream behind me, and not once do I look back as I bolted towards the front entrance to the station. I don't think I'll ever find the words to describe how relieved I was to see red and blue flashing lights outside. A cop was literally pulling up after getting a call from a passing driver that someone was acting all weird around back. Must have been after watching Marky Meth Freak scratching away at the drywall. Just crazy thinking that he and the raccoons had the same style of thinking. But anyway, thankfully the dude ran off when he saw the cop entering the station and I'm not sure what happened to the guy after that. Management had the hole patched up, and after that, we didn't get any more scratching or any more meth heads breaking in in the middle of the night. The scariest thing I ever saw while working at a gas station has to be the time I had this huge Goldberg-looking dude rock up to the register, slam down a 50, and shout gas. He immediately walks back out towards pump number four and I'm just like, whatever idiot. Ring him up for 50 bucks worth and activate the pump for him. That's when I notice how his car isn't parked at the pump properly. So I decided to watch thinking, this is gonna be funny. I thought I was gonna watch him struggle with the hose, get all angry about it, a healthy dose of karma to lighten up my shift. But that dude hadn't parked like an idiot by accident. He knew exactly what he was doing. He grabs the gas nozzle, opens up the passenger door of his car, then starts spraying gas all over the inside of his car. Obviously, I'm immediately like, no, 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 this is not good, and I smash the emergency shutoff switch before calling the cops. Then while I'm on the phone to the dispatcher, terrified this dude is about to set his car on fire in a freaking gas station, I see something even worse. The driver's side door opens up and some girl comes tumbling out of the car, soaked in gas and goes running towards the highway screaming in terror. By that time, everyone around was watching this whole thing unfold, 
as the dude chases the gas-soaked girl out of sight. This is back when I had to use the gas station's landline as we weren't allowed to keep cell phones with us while on shift so it's not like I could run out to see what's going on. I had to wait until the call was over to run out and see what everyone could see. Thankfully, the girl wasn't on fire since the guy didn't have a lighter handy, or if he did, he certainly saw sense with regards to using it. But my god, he was kicking the crap out of her and when the cops showed up, they had to tase the guy to get him to stop. I legitimately thought that I was about to watch a human fireball for a hot minute. This probably won't be the scariest story y'all have ever heard and at the time it just made me mad. But afterward, when I actually had time to think about it, I realized I basically dodged a bullet and that if I hadn't been a little quicker, I might not be around today to write this. A few years back I'm driving home from work one day when I see my gas light on. Naturally I pull into the next available gas station, fill my tank up, then head into the gas station itself to pay. Then, as I'm walking through the door, I accidentally bump into a guy who was walking out while staring at his phone. Even though he was most definitely at fault, I offered him an apology. But that didn't seem to be good enough for him. He gives me this look, and when I return his gaze, he says something like, You looking like you know me, homie? I didn't even really know what he meant by that, and I found his overall reaction to be nothing short of infuriating. But my mother brought me up to be the bigger man so I simply told him to be more careful next time and carried on to the store to pay for my gas. He made some comment like, the F do you say to me old man? But I disregarded it. He didn't follow me into the store so I didn't think that there'd be any more trouble. I walked to the back of the store, intent on grabbing a pack of those Korean moon pie things then remember what my wife said about getting started with my diet. I knew she was right and it was either start now or never get started at all, so I decided to forego my imported moon pies and just pay for my gas. Then as I'm walking back towards the pumps, it sort of looks like my front hood is up for some reason. Then as I get closer, I realize it really is my car that has its front hood up. Only I can't see who's behind it, presumably checking my engine. Under normal circumstances, that wouldn't alarm me too much, but considering the interaction I just had with that very rude young man, I get a bad, bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I started calling out before the very same young man darts out from behind my hood and starts walking away as quickly as he can. I don't move too fast these days, but by God did I hustle over to my car to see what kind of vandalism he'd been up to, only to see that he'd cut my brake fluid. My brake fluid of all things. He could have damaged 50 different things and he went right for my brake fluid. And if I hadn't just paid for my gas and gotten out of there, I might not have caught him doing it. Obviously I called the cops, then a mechanic as quickly as I could. And honestly I could barely believe what I told them, how a young man had taken such offense at the smallest slight that he tried to, well, murder me. Because let's face it, that's what he tried to do. I'd have gotten back on the highway, picked up speed, then when it came to break, that'd be the end of me. It took a tow truck to get my car out of there and the repairs cost me more than I expected. But on the bright side, the cops caught the kid who did it and he ended up picking up a charge for property damage of all things. I honestly wish he got more. Our official merch store is finally here. If you want to support more of our channel, check out our merch shop. The link is in the description down below. My name is Jason. I work in a local clothing store. We basically sell stuff that people think is really fancy, but it's basically the same stuff you can find at any clothing store, even places like Walmart or Goodwill sometimes. I've had this job for about two years now and while it isn't the greatest, a job is a job. I get to earn enough money to be able to have some independence from my parents which is really nice. This story took place in the winter of last year. It was a good while after Christmas but I don't remember exactly when it happened. I just remember there being snow on the ground the next morning after it all went down. 
so I work pretty usual hours for a college student. I know I'm technically a full-time student, but it doesn't feel like I have a whole lot of classes. Maybe I picked an easy major, or maybe I'm a genius, who knows. But I don't really study and I barely do the homework and I still manage to get pretty good grades. I remember there being a very strange looking man that started coming into the store. He didn't seem like the usual kind of customer that we would get. Most of the people that shop at the store are at least upper middle class. I don't mean to say that they were rich or anything, but if you had enough money to buy expensive clothes, and I'm talking like $50 for a t-shirt, then you're probably doing pretty well for yourself. But not this guy. This guy looked like he was two steps away from being homeless. He was an older guy, but not too old, probably 50 years old or something like that. But judging by how much of a weirdo he was, I guess I can't really be all that sure. He started coming in every single day, and he always bought something. It was not always something big. Sometimes it was a $70 pair of pants. Other time it was a really expensive watch. However, with as much stuff as he bought, he never seemed to wear any of it though. At least not for many of the times I'd ever seen him. He always dressed in a baggy sweatshirt or really old worn out overalls with a denim jacket on top, and the denim jacket had cuts and holes and it looked really weird because his overalls would be denim too. I don't know if he thought it went well as an outfit, but I wasn't about to tell this guy he dressed stupidly. After all, I did get a commission for everything that was sold in the store. However much of a creep he may have been, I will gladly welcome his business. I know the really weird thing I noticed about him was that he never actually tried on the clothes that he was buying, like ever. He would spend 40 minutes analyzing a pair of pants, hold it in front of himself in the mirror, feel the texture and try to look at it from different points of view, but he would never actually go into the dressing room and try them on. I thought that was the weirdest thing of all. I also remember the couple of times he wouldn't buy the item that he had been looking at, and there would always be this really musky smell to them. I know this may sound weird, but out of morbid curiosity, I would smell clothes after people tried them on after the store had closed. I can't really smell much otherwise, like I had seen this guy at least 20 different times and I never got a smell of him. But whenever I smelled those clothes that he had been looking at, I could smell some strange combination of body odor and smoke. I got really curious about what he does when he isn't randomly buying clothes in an expensive and overpriced store like this one. There was also this one time that he came into the store and specifically asked for me. I thought that was pretty weird considering that he had never really struck up a conversation with me or anything. Of all the times that I had interacted with him, it was always on a very formal basis and we both said the very bare minimum necessary. It was obvious that he didn't like coming to the store and I found myself drawing a blank coming up with reasons as to why he kept on doing it. I didn't think too much of it though. I was a college student, and anything outside of chilling with my friends and getting my assignments done didn't really matter at all that much to me. I remember this one night that I was doing laundry. I normally hate doing laundry, as you might imagine, but I specifically remember putting my clothes into the washing machine. I got a whiff of one of my sweatshirts that I thought smelled really weird. I smelled my sweatshirt again and it reminded me of the smell of the clothes from this one freaky guy at my job. Well the next day I was working my shift as usual and here came in the same old dude. This time he was checking out a pair of shoes, literally a pair of Crocs. I didn't even understand why we had Crocs at the store in the first place. They were exactly the same as the ones you can get at Walmart except for the fact that we charged $60 for them instead of $15. Well, this guy spent about 45 minutes looking at this pair of crops before he decided it was time to head out. He came up to my register and took an unusually long period of time to pay for his crocs. And it was while he was reaching for his wallet and paying that I remembered something. I totally forgot that I don't wear my sweatshirt at work. It's against the rules. You have to dress kind of nice, which normally meant a polo shirt or a decent dress shirt. Something you could throw a vest over and look like a halfway decently dressed representative of a fashion store. It got me on this whole train of thought that made me realize that my sweatshirt didn't smell that way because I was spending too much time with this weird guy. He must have somehow gotten a hold of my sweatshirt on his own accord. I remember my heart falling to the pit of my stomach when I made the realization. I felt myself turn red and started to sweat. 
However, freaked out as I became, he took no notice, just kept paying for his goofy pair of green Crocs. If you had ever smelled the smell, you would understand just how distinct it really was. I mean, there was nothing in the world like it. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there was a good possibility that this guy was creeping on me somehow, maybe even getting into my house. I quit my job that day on the spot. I didn't want to put myself in jeopardy for a goofy retail job, especially because that guy showed no sign of ever slowing down. He was there every single day I worked. A couple of weeks after the incident, I asked some of my former co-workers if he was still showing up on a regular basis. They told me they didn't remember exactly when, but he stopped coming in right around the time I stopped working there. This only made me more paranoid about the whole situation. I've developed a couple of possible theories as to what exactly was going on with this guy, but none of them really make any sense. I've tried telling a couple of my family members about it, but they all think I'm trolling them. To this day, I still haven't figured out exactly what happened, and I'm honestly kind of worried that I never will know what this creepy guy at the retail store was doing there every day, or why he stopped going after I quit. The worst experience of my life happened on June 20th, 2019. I was working at a local store. It's kind of a chain in this region of America, and I don't want to give out the name because it will make it obvious who I am. This story did get some media coverage, and as much as I want to share my story with the world in an honest way, I also want to remain as anonymous as possible. I don't want the rest of my life to forever be associated with this event, but this is how it went. My family's been struggling since 2015. My grandma got cancer, and we did our best to put her through chemotherapy. It didn't work out, and she tragically passed away that year. For some kind of legal reason, the financial burden of my grandmother's chemotherapy fell on my father. It just put a serious economic strain on him. I mean, could you imagine someone wants you to pay over $100,000 for medical treatment that didn't even save your family member? I don't understand why the system does this to people, but I'll keep politics out of this. It didn't ruin our family, but it did mean that our middle class lifestyle was now going to be extremely difficult to maintain. There was a lot less food in the house, we weren't able to go on vacation anymore, and making ends meet was generally a struggle. I remember my parents having a lot of fights over money, and I think it put a real strain on our relationship. Well, I was in high school at the time, and I did my best not to notice. It's tough being a high school girl and not being able to afford nice clothes or makeup. I remember some of the wealthier popular girls making fun of me for dressing like a bag lady, but... Sometimes a sweatshirt was the only thing that I had without any holes. I was an only child, so thankfully I was the only person that had to suffer along with my parents. High school went by, and don't get me wrong, it wasn't pleasant, but I got through it, and my family survived on too. As time went on, we just found ways to cope without having money. I knew that I was going to have to start getting a part-time job in school, which I was honestly kind of looking forward to. My parents told me that they would let me use my money on whatever I wanted, which I had been looking forward to for months, and that's when I got an after school job at this local chain store. It's kind of hard to explain. It's a weird combination of a deli, a gas station, and a convenience store all nicely wrapped into one with a very strange name that is almost notorious in this region. Well, I was enjoying my time especially because this was the summer between junior and senior year of high school. I was excited to graduate because I had really good grades and I was already receiving scholarship opportunities, some of them full rise to very nice colleges in my state. My parents were really proud of me, and as hard as it had been, we were ultimately a happy family at the end of the day. So I pretty much worked as much as I could over the summer. I was still kind of a loner by this point and I wanted to turn as much of my time into money as possible, so it didn't really matter if I spent 80 hours a week working because I didn't really have that much to do outside of work, especially with school being out for the summer. I remember there being a particular night that my manager asked me to work a little bit over. I normally started my shift at 6am and went home at 4pm. This was a pretty nice schedule honestly and work was easy enough that I really didn't mind. 
Sure, during the rush hours it could get a little hectic, but all the time in between was pretty chill. Well, my manager wanted me to stay until 10pm that night. That was a lot later than I was used to, and I wouldn't have said yes, but I wasn't working the next day, so I figured why not. I also got double time for working, which made it even better. You see, the way this place works is that after 8pm, most of the bakery closes down and there are a lot less people in sight. Normally, this time from 8 and well into the night, it's normally just enough people to run the register and get people to pay for gas. It normally means about two people working at a time. Me and this one guy I really didn't care for had to work this together. His name was Jeremy. He gave me really weird vibes and had made inappropriate comments. He wasn't dirty or perverted or anything, but he was just extremely offensive and never held back a nasty insult whenever he felt like throwing one at you. Me and him had a couple of instances where we argued, but by this point we both knew where we stood. We didn't like each other, but both of us wanted to do our job and get paid without too much of a hassle, so we were at least in a functional working relationship for the sake of our jobs. This was a weekday night and it just happened to be particularly slow. I never really worked there later shifts, so I had no idea what to really expect. And then my memory goes blank. For hours. I had no idea what had happened. I just remember waking up in the middle of the store and getting up and feeling really sick. I was dizzy and confused and it took me a few minutes to realize where I was or what had happened. I remembered as I walked across the tiled floor, I heard a deep crunching noise beneath my feet. I didn't look down. I was too dazed, but I assumed that they were M&Ms or some kind of candy. After walking outside, I got even more confused than I already was. I went back inside and saw blood. I looked down at my shoes and noticed that I was covered in a thick, dark red liquid. I started hyperventilating and called 911. They were there within minutes. I was rushed to the hospital and that was that. It was only a couple of days after explaining everything to the police that I pieced together what had happened. When I was at the hospital, they found drugs in my system. This surprised me because I didn't even smoke cigarettes. The drugs they found in my system were likely the kind that you find in roofies or whatever, and the police had a theory that it went something like this. Jeremy was a mentally unstable individual. He decided that he wanted to end his own life. He was kind of obsessed with becoming infamous, even ran a whole bunch of social media accounts where he was desperately attempting to become a celebrity. Well, he figured the only way he was ever going to become truly famous was if he committed some kind of horrible crime in some terrible fashion that shocked the world, and he decided that it was going to be that night with me there. The police believed that as crazy as he may have been, he wasn't a fundamentally violent person so he couldn't bring himself to hurt me or anything else like that, but he did have a plan. He slipped a roofie or some kind of drug into my monster that I'd been drinking during that shift. After I passed out, he shot himself in the head staring at the security camera. He even set up his smartphone on a tripod to capture it in hope that it would be used as footage on the news. I'm pretty sure they did actually use it, and when I had woken up, the crunchy stuff on the floor, or fragments, was a skull. This all had been really traumatic and I don't know what to do anymore. I quit my job, and I've just been hanging out at my house over the summer waiting for school to start back up, kind of staring into space. My parents have been really understanding, but they have no idea how to help me. Despite our bad financial situation, they scraped together enough money to send me to therapy. I haven't had a whole lot of time to recover from this whole situation, but I do feel like I've made some progress. Some days I feel extremely apathetic. There's a big part of me that doesn't know what to do with my life now. I feel so different after having gone through this experience, especially because I still get contacted by the occasional journalist wanting to do another story on this. But I think this will be the final and last time that I have to relive this. So, I have this friend, they're a little bit off the walls, 
One of those conspiracy theorists, very much into the paranormal types of people. I'm talking about the kind of person that watches the X-Files and thinks it's probably true. Of course, she dresses up like she's just playing around and doesn't actually believe in it wholeheartedly, but I'm smart enough to know that she uses humor as a way to distance herself from what she actually believes. I think some of the crazy stuff that she says she actually thinks. No, this isn't to disparage her or anything like that. She's an otherwise really nice person and she only starts talking about this kind of stuff once you get her going. Sometimes we can go days without ever talking about ghosts or aliens or anything else like that, but if someone starts talking about feeling a spirit in the room, that's the end of it for the night. I just wanted to give you that background because I feel it's very pertinent to the story. Well, this particular friend happens to work at Walmart. There have been a lot of recent changes lately and what happened is that she got stuck on the night shift. I'm sure you can imagine how this went. He puts someone that's into paranormal stuff on night shift and the next thing you know, they have a million and one different stories about ghosts and monsters and everything else. That's kind of how it went for the first few weeks. Every time I hung out with her, she would talk about how horrible it was to be working on night shift and then she would start talking about all of the monsters and creatures that she would see out of the corner of her eye. I just remember thinking to myself multiple times if she actually believes that she sees stuff while she's at work. Well, as time went on, she became much more mild with the stories. I guess she had gotten used to working the night shift at Walmart, and then I remember there being one party that we went to. It was me, her, and a bunch of other people from our friend group. It wasn't one of those crazy alcohol-filled adventures as you see in movies or anything like that. It was much more of a bunch of friends getting together and hanging out. I mean, we're all adults and everything. The person whose house we're hanging out at owned the home, but I don't know what else we could have called it other than a party. Anyway, my one perceptive friend had a little bit too much to drink this night, and she started going on about her job like usual. And then all of a sudden, things took a turn for the worse. She started talking about seeing a dead person walking around the store. I remember her talking about the exact details of how he died. She claimed that he had shot himself in the heart, and she saw him walking around Walmart late at night when no one else was around. Some of our other friends were less hesitant to call her out on this nonsense, and she started getting really offended. She left that night after, and in retrospect, I probably should have stopped her from driving home considering that she was extremely intoxicated. If I'm going to be honest with you, that didn't even cross my mind until the next morning. This guy that ended his life by shooting himself in the heart became the only thing she ever talked about when it came to the ghosts and whatnot of her night shift job at Walmart. I found it really strange. It was one of the less believable stories that she would tell us about. I mean, she would always talk about there being a pack of wolves in the forest on the other side of the Walmart parking lot, but it just didn't have the same glamour that that story about the guy did. The thought of there being some zombie walking around Walmart at night that only she could see seemed ridiculous as it sounds, and I just kind of chalked it up to her own mental problems for it all. Well, a couple of months went by. She was still on this, you know, guy shooting himself in the heart guy kick, even after all this time. I decided to do some research on this specific Walmart to prove her that no one had ever died or near the premises, especially in that way. I remember getting my laptop out one night and googling this local Walmart's address. I'm going to spare any identifying details for obvious reasons. I read about every single death that had occurred on this premise since the place was built in the 1980s. I read about one guy who accidentally died of a stroke in 85. I read about there being a terrible accident with a forklift about seven years ago. And I didn't see anything about some guy shooting himself in the heart or anything of that nature. I was just about to be done with my research and I was in that post-research phase where I just kind of was reading about random information aimlessly and that's when I came across the news archives that I couldn't believe. It had been written during this time that the Walmart was being built and the story went like this. One of the crew members who was responsible for building the Walmart had some serious problems. His only son died at 10 years old and I guess this guy never really recovered after that. He had taken his own life after working the graveyard shift one night. 
The article talked about him being the only person that was willing to work all the way to 12am and sometimes later, as this was apparently before 24 hour Walmarts. He had a shotgun in his truck and then he ended his own life right in the forest nearby. And here's the crazy part. He shot himself in the chest exactly the way my friend had described. I hadn't told my friend about this. I know I would never hear the end of it. But I just find it so strange that her weird, goofy little interest in the paranormal somehow uncovered something like this. Now every time she talks about ghosts or the paranormal, I make sure to start listening for something that might be true. And don't get me wrong, I try to filter out the obvious hoopla, but now that I've seen her get something unbelievably right once, I'm just waiting for her to do it again. I live in a city with a public transportation system. They've been extremely short-staffed, and more often than not, you have to call to make sure your bus is even coming. On weekdays, during business hours, the public transit operator will order a lift for you to get to work if your bus isn't showing up or if they're short a driver. Tuesday, I'm at the bus stop after checking multiple times if my bus is coming, only to find out that it wasn't. They ordered me a lift, and this nice older gentleman was my driver. We had casual conversation, and he started to ask personal questions. I'm a bartender, and I'm super friendly already, so I didn't think his questions were ill-intentioned. Told him I'm not married, and that I'm pretty much a loner. I basically go to work and go home and spend my time with family. He then says, I'd marry you in a heartbeat. Again, I'm just thinking that he's being funny or nice. I asked him to drop me off at the downtown grocery so I could pick up some things that I needed for work. When we stopped, he said he was joking that he's married and has a son my age. Asked if I was interested in maybe meeting him. Since I have a terrible track record, I figured it wouldn't hurt meeting someone out of my circle and comfort zone, so I gave the man my number and we parted ways. The next morning he texted me and asked if I needed a ride to work. I told him he didn't have to do that and that I was sure my bus was running. He said it would be his pleasure and that he'd pick me up at my house at 3pm. Then about an hour later he asked if I wanted to have lunch with him before work. I told him I was busy and that I couldn't do that. He said okay, see you at 3. He shows up right at 3 and lets me know that he's outside. While I'm finishing getting my things together, open the door and he's starting to walk up my stairs to my house. I told him I was ready and we could head downtown. When I get in the back seat, he turns around and says that he has a confession. He told me from the time I took off my mask, his heart danced like a butterfly. He said that he hasn't been able to stop thinking about me since the day before and that he'd love to spend time with me and that he'd pay me for my time if I spent a day with him. That's when I started to feel super uncomfortable. The whole ride was making me cringe, but know that when you're in a situation like that with a predator, playing nice is sometimes safer than freaking out. He continued on the entire ride about how he loved me at first sight and wanted to make me his Lebanese queen. As we got closer to downtown, I started to feel relief. He dropped me off at my hotel and said, see you tomorrow. That evening at work, I checked my phone after a bust happy hour and he's texted me a couple of times. He sent a picture of the hotel and said that he'd wait for me to get off to give me a ride home. I told him I already had a ride, but thank you anyways. Thursday morning, I'm out running errands with my mom and sister. He texts me and asks how early he can pick me up because he can't stop thinking about me. I asked him to please stop and that I was with family. He continues to text me all day and evening, begging to see me and telling me his heart is aching to see his Lebanese queen. I just kept saying to please stop. Now Friday morning is where stuff hit the fan. He tells me he loves me no matter what. He said I told my wife about you and that I'm in love with you and I want a divorce. I told him to please don't do that and that it wasn't right to treat his wife that way. He said it wasn't my fault. They were drifting apart anyways. Then he said I'm picking up for dinner at 5.30 and I'm not taking no for an answer. I ignored the messages during the day and just went about my off day. At around 5.25, 
My video doorbell rings and he's standing on my porch for at least 15 minutes. I told him I wasn't home and that he should leave. He continues to text me and even begs to come pick me up from my parents. I was home the whole time, but I was just too scared to let him know that. I eventually called the non-emergency police station, but he had already left by the time I got through. I filed a general report, but technically they can't do anything unless he's standing on my porch threatening me. They advised me to make a report through Lyft, so I did. And I haven't heard anything since then, but honestly, that was one of the most threatening and creepy moments of my life. I've also attached the doorbell footage so you can get an idea of what he's like. Come on, open up, please. Be sweet. Don't disappoint me, please. Yeah. Come on, hon, please open up. I know you're in there. So I live in a pretty quiet part of my city, in a small two-bedroom basement apartment with my roommate, who was gone for the summer. I stayed here and worked during the summer. I do not get out all that often and don't know many people as I moved to the area two years ago. Just this last Saturday night, I was doing my usual gaming with some friends I had met on the internet, good friends of mine that I had known since I was 16, when I get this call from a private number. Now, I rarely get phone calls from people I know. Normally, communication is done just by texting. So I pick up, and what sounds like a man, maybe in his early to mid-40s, picks up the phone. The conversation went as follows. Hello? Hey, who is this? Uh, who is this? It's Randy. Sorry, Randy. You've got the wrong number. I hang up. About ten minutes later, he calls me again. And so I thought, oh, he must have accidentally dialed my number again. So I ignored it and thought nothing of it, continue enjoying my time with my friends playing some games, Diablo 3, and by now it was about 9pm and 9.30. Around 10pm I get the call again. Being the not really giving a shit kind of guy, I just ignored it again. After all, I don't know anyone and I have not known anyone in my lifetime by the name of Randy. Pretty logical to not answer, I would just be wasting my time, I thought. About an hour and a half passes by. It's about 11 p.m. now. I get the call yet again. So I answered, and literally the call goes exactly the same way as before. With one problem, I think I ended up saying too much. I added to the conversation, Sorry, you really have the wrong number. I don't know any Randys. Oh, you don't know me. Yeah, that's right. Well then. I guess I'm going to stop by, and I think you'll get a pretty good idea of who I am when I'm done with you. At this point, I was instantly freaked out, and I just hung up. I was getting kind of scared, but I got a grip on myself and just figured that he must have had beef with someone, and just doesn't get that he's calling the wrong person. A few minutes later, I hear a vehicle pull into my driveway. Since I live in the basement and there is a window facing the driveway, his headlights were shining right in. I figured it was my neighbor coming home from his night shift at the hospital. I live in a triplex. A few minutes pass by and the lights are still on. Quickly it all came flooding back into my mind. It's him, I thought, and my stomach began to knot and I felt so afraid my hands began to tremble. I peeked through the curtains and watched the car for quite some time. I couldn't tell if there was anyone inside or not since the headlights were bright. He doesn't leave, so I called my brother who lives not far from me. I told him what happened and he said, Okay, stay in the house. Keep the door locked. I'm coming to get you, man. 
Now my brother's a pretty intimidating guy if you've never met him before. Six foot four, broad shoulders, big badass looking beard, etc. He comes up, I let him in and he says, There's nobody in the car, dude. Yet the headlights are on. I pack up some things and we head off. He was kind enough to let me stay at his place for a few days until I felt okay. Upon returning to my apartment today, the same vehicle is in my driveway. I started freaking out, but there's nobody in the car. I noticed blankets on all the seats. For some reason, I looked in the opposite direction, right at my garbage bin, and written directly on the side, it says, It's me. I quickly went into my apartment and locked the door and took a shower. When I got out, the car was gone. Now I'm writing this. Honestly, I'm pretty fucking scared right now. When I was 22, I moved a thousand miles away from my Midwest home to the beautiful foothills of Tennessee. I had a new job, new car, and a nice apartment, but didn't know a soul outside of work. If my phone rang, I expected to hear a faraway family member or my long-distance boyfriend who was still in college. This was a landline, no cell phones yet. Despite being very alone, I was managing well with the excitement of all the new things in my life. I had only lived there about two weeks when the unwanted calls started. The first call, a man's friendly voice asked what I was doing. I couldn't place him and thought maybe it was one of my cousins or uncles. I have a huge extended family. I ask him his name, he laughs a little, and his tone gets dark, a bit angry, and he says, You know exactly who this is, darling. I pause, deciding if this guy simply called the wrong number or is a creep. I choose the former, laugh, and politely tell him he has the wrong number. He then recites my brand new, unlisted, unpublished phone number and my name. What the fuck, I thought. An intense chill races through me. I've only given my new number to my parents, sister, boyfriend, apartment manager, and employer. I'm new to the city and this lovely southern state. He does not like it that I tell him he called the wrong number and starts yelling at me, then tells me in a much calmer voice the many vulgar things he's going to do to me. I hang up and brush it off. He calls again around 1am. I tell him to screw himself and hang up. He keeps calling, so I unplug the phone and return to sleep. However, as days go by, the calls continue and escalate. He starts mentioning personal things about me, said he liked the white quilt on my bed, knew what was in my fridge, that he's allergic to cats, I had one, and then asked me if I was in love with Mary. As I listened to his words, I was standing in my kitchen looking at the calendar taped to the fridge. It had Mary written in pink on the 17th with a heart around it because Mary is my sister and the 17th is her birthday. I started shaking and crying because suddenly I realized this creep has been in my apartment. I was alone with no friends or family to run to for the night. It was me versus a creepy mystery man. I didn't sleep much that night. Early the next morning, I talked to the apartment complex manager before heading to work, telling her what had happened and that I want the locks changed that day. She gets a weird look on her face, and after a long pause, she says she knows who's been in my apartment and that it won't happen again. What? I thought to myself. It turns out she had a creepy, rapey maintenance guy who noticed a young woman moving into an apartment alone and that I was his new pet. She had the locks changed immediately and promised that she would personally keep the other key. Although the call stopped, I was paranoid for a year as I came and went from my apartment because I never even knew what this guy looked like. I moved out the moment my lease was up. Only after thinking about it years later did I realize that her weird expression likely meant that it had happened before. Plus, she didn't even fire him. I regret not calling the cops. I was young and naive. Back in 8th grade, probably halfway through the school year, I received a phone call from an unknown caller. Usually, 
I wouldn't answer for a number I didn't recognize, or sometimes I would do so in an accent, but I would always hang up after a second or two. Things changed, however, when the second I answered, I heard a man saying my full name in a questioning tone, like as if he was asking for confirmation that it was me. Being just a kid and thinking this was one of my parents' friends, or someone I could talk to, I told him that it was me. Big mistake, but I didn't know at the time. That first phone call I don't remember much of, except that he hung up not long after I said that was me. Some time passed, maybe less than a week, when I got an unknown call again. I didn't answer, and then I kept getting spam calls, so I finally answered and this guy was asking me which shows I like to watch. I got the idea that maybe I shouldn't be talking to this guy, so I just immediately hung up. Not much long after, another couple of calls came in until I said to stop calling me, and he responded to something of the effect of, hanging up mid-conversation is rude. My dad heard me and asked who I was talking to, so I told him I didn't know and handed him the phone. My dad asked who this was and to stop calling my number in his angry dad tone. Then he got a confused face for a second before getting really angry and shouting at them before they abruptly hung up. My dad later told me that this person knew my father's name and he told him, don't be so angry, before hanging up. Pretty soon these calls would happen at least once a day and I would almost always hand the phone to my dad for him to yell at the guy. We told all our friends and family to stop if they were prank calling me. We tried getting police involved and we also contacted my middle school saying there was a guy being creepy with me. The guy never called during school hours and he would usually call at first when I was home alone, but soon switched it up to calling around the time my father got home from work. This guy sounded young. For a long time we thought my uncles or their friends were playing pranks on us. He sounded maybe mid to late 20s and sounded sort of Latino. Never had an angry tone and never said anything malicious, but he was a stalker and he knew the names of my parents, sister, my dogs, some cousins and my grandparents. He never called when we had company over and it was never after 8pm. At one point I was sitting in my room and got a call. By this point it was nearing the last few weeks of school and because this guy never said anything bad and police said there was nothing to do, I just answered the phone and asked what he wanted. I remember clear as day he was listing off video games, Red Dead Redemption, Modern Warfare 2, Halo 3, etc. I looked at my disc stand and saw he was reading off the list in order that my games were, top to bottom. I stood up and looked out the window, but nobody was there. After the list was done I just stood there and he told me something about having good taste in games and that we should play some time. At this moment I was scared shitless. I cried and called my dad. He came home early and we realized like idiots that we could just change my number. We changed my number and I purged my Facebook account and we all set our accounts to private. Maybe six months later we moved and after changing the number I never got any calls from this guy. The reason I came to tell this story is because I've been getting unknown numbers calling me for the past couple of days and I never answer them anymore but telling my girlfriend about it, she reminded me about that guy. So, needless to say, I will be changing my number soon as a precaution. Our official merch store is finally here. If you want to support more of our channel, check out our merch shop. The link is in the description down below. See you on the next video.